Good afternoon, financial professionals. My name is Jennifer Nadu, case design specialist here at E4 Insurance Services, welcoming you to The Brew, building relationships every week. For those of you tuning in for the first time today, welcome and thank you. We like to kick off the brewcast by celebrating what today's national day is. And today, very near and dear to E4's heart, uh, it is National Wisconsin Day, with one of our offices being located there, and our guest is also there as well. It is also National Gumdrop Day, which uh, there's an old-fashioned candy for you. And last but not least, it's National Single Awareness Day, which I had no idea that existed, but apparently it's a compliment holiday to Valentine's Day for those of those of you or us or whatever that are single. <laughs> On today's brew, we welcome North Star Funding Partners President Dale Humphrey for a special two-part brewcast to discuss finance life insurance and higher interest rates. Today's first episode will focus on the current and anticipated industry con uh, conditions. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, as always, please feel free to use the chat box to share your thoughts or ask questions. And all attendees are in a drawing for a prize and we will announce the winner at the end of the call. Uh, gonna welcome Dale onto the call. Before we um, dive into this, Dale, of your part one of the two-part series with you, um, I know that you're going to be addressing managing pricing, pressure, and volatility in a fast-changing environment in the world of premium finance. Um, very happy to have you on. I know that um, premium finance is really dependent on so many factors, interest rates, being one of them. And as I was honestly preparing for this call and, and looking at things and just from being in the industry, sometimes I think if, if is premium finance still a good idea with everything that's going on, um, I'll definitely hand the call over to you now, as I know that's a question that you're going to answer and, and you have so much more with us today, but um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dale, for sharing your time with us today. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, some of this is going to be, at least for people in the financial services community, hopefully not revelatory uh, and, and somewhat of a review, but we're, we're approaching a one-year anniversary, actually, when uh, the monetary conditions uh, worldwide, for all intents and purposes, did, did change. And as we may recall, uh, back probably about 18 months or so ago, um, as some of these key inflation indicators were ticking upward, that the, the Federal Reserve and other authorities were are using terminology transitory. That mm -hmm. is the thought, the thought process of, of some of the pricing pressures that were going on were due to extraneous factors. Uh, we were coming off of COVID. Uh, we had supply chain shocks uh, around the world. A, a lot of different exogenous factors that were contributing to that. And it wasn't necessarily a strict monetary or actually a strict first fiscal uh, phenomenon. There was other things going on there that at least at that point in time, they thought would be alleviated or, or, or settled down over a period of time. Well, as we now know today that, and, and we knew probably in very short order last year as we headed into the spring, that that was not the case. Uh, in inflation across a broad number of uh, indices and types of indicators took, took a strong hold. And we, we were producing reports and data was coming forth that we've not seen in quite some time. And, and the Federal Reserve has two primary mandates. Uh, one is price stability and one is full employment. Uh, price stability does reflect into the, the general interest rate environment. Uh, the Federal Reserve does not control interest rates. They control the money supply. And, and they have tools to do that with. And one of the key things that they can use to try to control the money supply is something we refer to as the federal funds rate. And again, this should not be anything that's this news to anybody on this call, but the federal funds rate has been dramatically increased uh, since that period of time. Uh, we, we settled down a little bit in terms of, of, the, of the hypes, but we were going through 75 basis point interval changes on a, on a fairly frequent basis. And we've had, uh, as, as that has occurred, 
Uh, also behind the scenes, they do something uh, called quantitative tightening. It's a little bit more of an academic thing. I won't get into too much, but the especially during COVID and, and actually pre-COVID, the Federal Reserve accumulated a massive balance sheet, a historically high balance sheet. Basically, they were holding all forms of securities, fixed income securities, even junk debt, which they've never done historically before that point. And now they're trying to shrink, shrink that balance sheet. That's a more quiet movement to, to deal with the money supply and some other rate pressures. Uh, the federal funds rate, though, is something that's very overt. It's very much in your face. And as we now know today, that, that, that rates have responded accordingly. So a, a broad range of different rate indices have changed upward, uh, prime, other key indicators. Certainly to most consumers out there, they're most going to be immediately affected by looking at mortgage rates, auto loans, everything like that. So as they began to, to ratchet the, what I would call the supply side of the equation, the demand side of the equation has changed as well. And in our industry, uh, we that is the life financing industry, and, and simply put, that's using debt to pay for life insurance premiums or fund life insurance premiums. Um, we have been dramatically affected by this. So all our base rates have increased uh, commensurately, along with some of the changes occurring at a, at a, at a broad monetary level. Um, it, these are some of the, the higher highest interest rates that I've seen some time. I've been in this industry a very long period of time. And so we've had essentially in some cases uh, more than doubling in terms of the interest rate charge in these loans. Uh, for, for our average size large case transaction, which is usually a $750,000 premium in higher case, we were lending out at probably a sub 3% rain, uh, probably about a year and a half ago or so. And now we're closer to 7%. So, so quite, quite a dramatic change in that. And that, that impacts a number of things. It, it, it certainly is one of the more, let's say, glaring things that you analyze when you have to deal with these transactions, you have to price these transactions and things like that. And, and we're very much a forward-looking industry here. And these transactions tend to have a maturity date of at least 12 to 15 years. So we've got a lot of things that we have to consider in this mix. But there's no question at all, we've got a markedly different rate environment. And again, back to kind of the academic side of the equation is, is when will the, uh, the monetary authorities begin to maybe move off the, of the accelerator of the rate increases? Um, the last rate increase, at least on the FFR side, was 25 basis points. And, and one of the challenges they have is trying to forecast what these changes will exactly do. Uh, that is, they're not, they do have an immediate impact, but what's more difficult for these authorities to deal with is what is the impact 12, 18 months down? And there is still discussions, Are is the Federal Reserve going to approach this with absolute tenacity? That is, the you've heard terminology hawkish and dovish side of the equation there. Uh, there is some hawkish members uh, within the FOMC that are absolutely steadfast at, at, at slaying the dragon of inflation irrespective of the economic consequences. If, if, if this is going to result in a recession later this year, or perhaps first quarter 2024, that's just going to be an artifact of it. Uh, you might have heard the terminology soft landing, uh, hard landing, these things. We don't know yet. Um, you know, the Fed's kind of in a bind. Uh, they're seeing inflation coming down in some areas, but they've got a very tight labor market on the other hand. Um, recessions don't normally have uh, tight labor markets. Uh, right. we, have lay we have layoffs, we have other dynamic things that go on. So a lot of this is, is all forecasting. We don't know, and we're going to have to gauge what the Fed actions do. But a lot of this has been definitely priced into the industry. So yeah. I, I heard, yeah. No, Sorry, God, sorry Dale. Um, you know, you mentioned the recession and, and, you know, it was a great point as far as recession and then what the employment rates are now, which are are positive, I believe. Um, you also mentioned the FFR. Um, I, I can't help but think back to the 07 and the 08 credit crisis that we are, were in. It, it makes me reflect on it, but I do think it is, it is a bit different. Um, I know, I think that's one of the things that you're going to address here, as well as the, the transition from LIBOR to SOFR. Um, so uh, pardon the interrupt, but I just wanted to um, just pepper that in as well, but please, please continue. 
Yeah, I've gone through four major shocks, as I would call it, while I've been in this industry. And certainly the credit crisis, uh, 08, 09 specifically, was the most stressful for me. Uh, that was a different situation. Uh, I mean, I don't go through all the entire history here, but that was interesting in that it affected very much the supply side of the equation. And when I talk about the supply side of the equation, I am talking about exclusively the finance life insurance business. At that point in time, I was on the supply side of the equation. I was running a debt facility that was actually backstopped by one of the world's largest banks. And uh, they decided ultimately to exit the business. And that that also uh, was a precursor to many institutions leaving this business. And they were some of the largest, Credit Suisse, Royal Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Canada, many, many others that had specialty lending divisions uh, within their, their silo uh, were essentially exiting the business. It's not because they ran out of money. It's because they had other pressures that they're dealing with. And, mm -hmm. and, this, and this business was an artifact. It was a side, it was a side business. So the, the stress from that side, not only the fact that, of course, that had a broad ranging economic impact as well, you know, the fallout from the derivatives being priced into the collateralized mortgage obligations that what really was the catalyst behind a lot of this. So the, the, the stress economically at that point in time was a magnitude higher than this. This is a, this is a different type of situation. Uh, this is not going to have the same degree of, of ongoing effect. And, and the banks are much more, much more capitalized. There's been absolutely no discussion whatsoever of the financial service sector coming under this degree of stress that it did for that period of time. So it's a mm -hmm. very different environment. Mm -hmm. It's not less stressful for me because the interest rate situation impacts the business very directly. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the, how we price uh, these types of loans. Uh, the loans use various benchmarks. And historically in this business, ever since I've been in this business, the London Interbank Offer Rate or LIBOR has been the common benchmark. Mm -hmm. and, and what we mean by a benchmark rate is how you base the rate. Now, that's, it's not a straight rate. In our industry, we price these loans based on two pieces usually, the benchmark plus a spread. But LIBOR was a historic benchmark for, for quite some time. Yes. And again, I don't want to go through the whole history, but, but, but LIBOR fell under disrepute uh, for numerous reasons and is now being essentially worldwide uh, being jettisoned as a, as a use in, in structured finance. Uh, it'll take some time to do that, but actually the finance life insurance industry has reacted very quickly. Uh, we do not have one single uh, debt provider within our portfolio that's using LIBOR any longer. Mm. Um, they all use different indexes and various, various, various reference rates. Um, and, and, and the decision there is one that's exclusive to that financial institution. Um, I tell people that it doesn't necessarily have a, the same impact to the all-in rate, as we call it, which is the absolute rate charge in the loan, but it tends to define volatility more so. Um, are they using a 30-day short rate, 60-day, one-year reference? Is the rate locked for a year? All these other considerations. Uh, but there's no question at all right now that, that LIBOR is in, in the rear view mirror. We won't see it again. And they're all using various different pricing mechanisms. Uh, the other thing, too, that, that's come up in discussion, and there's a, a counterpoint to this that I can go into, but we've also had a lot more interest in fixed rates. And, and that is from, from a group of people, clients, advisors that have some degree of concern that higher rates are going to be something that's going to be persistent. And that gets back to our whole forecasting concept here. Are, are we dealing with a persistently high interest rate environment? Or are these things going to happen economically that the, the, the Federal Reserve is going to turn the course a little bit and start moderating monetary policy? That is increasing the money supply. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to see about that. Um, in terms of the pricing in this industry, it's, it's based on a number of factors. Um, there are some banks that just operate off their balance sheet, meaning they're going to gauge a differential between the deposits they have and, and what they have to lend money out as. Uh, there's one part of my, my industry that's basically an asset gathering exercise from these large banks that essentially want to use financing, premium finance as a mechanism to bring in assets. And they tend to have very low rates, but there's, a, uh, there's an offset to the transaction. That is the individual getting a loan for the financing transaction has to park a multi-million dollar investment portfolio there. Um, we tend to deal with here uh, what's called specialty lenders or single silo providers. That is, we want a group uh, that has a dedicated team for financing. It's pretty much the sole focus of the bank in terms of that silo, as we call it. 
uh, that has a number of advantages. Uh, obviously, they're completely focused on that single business line, so the degree of expertise is relatively high. They tend to operate much more quickly than, than institutions that are more diversified. And yes, we can build a strategically more important relationship with them. So that's, that's where you still lie. Um, as far as pricing is concerned, again, our average loan right now probably is going out probably about 6.5%, 6.75% as far as an all-in rate is concerned. Mm-hmm. And, and most of the transactions are going to be done on a variable rate. What it means by that is that rate will float. So it'll float based on the performance of the benchmark or the movement in the benchmark. The biggest question I get is, oh, your business has come to a standstill, right? Uh, right. No, it has not. <laughs> um, it, it, it certainly has an impact. I mean, we're very we're the largest company of our type in this country, so I think we're fairly reflective of the industry. Uh, but there has been a, t- a, a tale of two different customer segments. And, and what I mean by that is about six years ago now, uh, we developed something which we call internally a small case platform. And it was a fin- it's a financing solution that was orientated towards a different client segment and also different, different size policies, basically. That platform can finance $50,000 in premium cases, which again, in the brokerage area, and I, I be, I'm very careful about the way I phrase some of this, uh, in the brokerage community, that is a fantastic case. And there's any no other age, agent around that's not going to be very happy and pleased about knocking down $50,000 in premium. Of course, yeah. Now, in, in my business, though, that's not a big case. And mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's far below average, in fact. Uh, it doesn't mean we get less excited about it, but it's a different type of case. Mm-hmm. It also is usually a different type of customer. And my business is, is I wouldn't say it's regulated per se, but it's monitored, policed, if you will, for the sake of another term, by the life insurance companies. And a number of years ago, they, they coalesced around and, and tried to ring fence this business and provide stricter requirements as to what you can and cannot do. Yeah. And one of the areas the carriers have been focused on, very rightfully so, is the net worth of the guarantor, which is usually the insured, entering the transaction. Mm-hmm. That is, they want to make sure people aren't getting over their heads in these deals, because most of these transactions are very large. Uh, they're very serious obligations. In fact, the average loan probably at year 10 that we've managed is probably about $14.5 million. Mm-hmm. A lot of debt. Now, granted, that's offset by certain things, which I can talk about later. But so the carrier said, look, it, we want to be a little bit more careful about who's entering these transactions. We want to be able to monitor the deals, we want to make sure the person's qualified to the extent they can do that. And so one of the lines of demarcation, if you will, is this thing called the net worth. What is the net worth of the guarantor, the insured, and in the transaction? And so most carriers sit at today a $5 million net worth. We've got some at 10 plus, but just let's say $5 million is the minimum verifiable net worth of the individual being able to enter one of these transactions. And again, there's a little bit of a finite analysis to it to the balance sheet. What's the degree of liquidity? Um, are they showing a, a $5 million net worth of which $4.5 million is their business of which we don't have proper valuation of? Again, a little extended Understood. for this conversation, but yeah. that's part of the process. Mm-hmm. So when we built this small case platform, we wanted to go to the carriers and say, hey, we've got a solution, but it's going to be maybe a sub $2 million net worth, maybe even a $1 million net worth. Well, some have looked at us and they didn't quite understand how to deal with it. And, and others were fairly receptive. Uh, receptive from the perspective, there's probably 10 times that the number of people that could qualify for a transaction like that versus the larger case platform. So we did bring forth the solution and and what we branded as an insured retirement advantage, we've talked about that in other calls, is our small case solution. And, and that, that's gone tremendously well, but I'll be very frank and honest with you, that is the one customer segment which has been mostly impacted from a business flow standpoint with these rate changes. That is, we have seen a slowdown in the volume coming through on that platform. And there's a number of reasons for it. And they're all good and they're all legitimate reasons. Um, One of the primary concerns that I have is I don't sell financing. I don't push financing. I'm a risk manager. I, I want to help advisors place properly qualified people in these transactions and be able to manage them over time effectively. And so if we have individuals that do not have the same robust balance sheet as a wealthier person, that maybe have a little less li- limited liquidity and things like that, the, the pricing pressure can be a little bit more real. It can be a little bit more apparent to them. 
Also, that transaction to some extent depends a little bit more on this illustrated arbitrage, as we call it, between the policy cash value and the loan balance. Mm -hmm. The majority of policies in the finance life insurance business are indexed universal life, some extent whole life as well, but, but IUL. And one of the concepts of IUL, uh, at least in a financing schematic, is that the policy is going to credit long-term at a rate greater than what the loan is going to be charged at. Uh, it's not the only concept in the business, and I tend to de-emphasize that aspect of it, but it's one part of it. And the smaller case platform tends to be a little bit more dependent on that dynamic between the policy CSV and loan balance. Well, everybody on this call basically knows the crediting range of these products and what you can illustrate them at. And if you're going out the door with a loan interest rate of 6.5%, what has that done? I mean, the small case platform uh, about, let's say, 14 months ago had an all in interest rate on the first year of the loan of 2.6%. Now we're above 6.5%. That right. changes the dynamics of the transaction. It changes Greatly. the track of the transaction. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. to be crystal with you, we have seen a slowdown in the small case platform. Again, I'm not too animated about it. Uh, it, it, it. If these people are uncomfortable in the transaction or for numerous reasons, we don't push it. And we Certainly. don't want the advisors to put the agenda. Right. Now, the other side of the coin is, is the bulk of our business, the bedrock of our business. And, a, and that's a large case platform. And I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it hasn't slowed down at all, but I will tell you that we've got a stable amount of business on that side of the equation. In fact, we probably have closed more $3 million premium cases in the last six months that we've, we've had in some time. Interesting. Now, I can, I can describe that in numerous ways. And, and one is that wealthy people continue to like to borrow money. <laughs> you know, they, they basically look at these things as an opportunity cost play. If, if I've got better uses of my money, that can yield higher than what this interest rate is charging this loan, this still is a good deal to me. Also, the way that we frame the transactions, the way we model the transactions, we're going to get that a little bit more into that in part two, um, can be done a little bit differently with these people too. They can bear the higher cost in the transaction. Uh, one of the things that we definitely have done in our modeling aspect and the way we frame the transaction initially is the out-of-pocket contribution. And, and what that means is that's the annual contribution that the guarantor is making towards the loan has gone up as a percentage of premium. Um, we, we like leverage here. We, court, we operate in a world of leverage, but we do not like too much leverage. Um, leverage defines the risk in the transaction. So if I can give you an example, if we had, a, and we'll get into a very specific example, but let's say with a million dollar premium case, and maybe you could run the out-of-pocket in the lower interest rate environment at $150,000 or 15% as a ratio expressed to the premium sell. Today, it's probably closer to 20, 25%. So we're also doing things dynamically to the policy uh, to, to change it and the, and the way it'll hopefully behave over time differently. So we've been doing a number of adjustments on a large case platform, but again, it hasn't meant a wholesale change in the trajectory of what we're doing from a business standpoint. The wealthy are still borrowing money for these deals. Um, I will tell you the intake side is a little bit lower, but our close ratios um, are, are still fairly high. And as you have here, the emerging affluent are more sensitive to, yes. to the pricing. Gotcha. Um, yeah. I, I see here too, that you have the forecasting of lower rates for 2023, early 2024. Uh, can you can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it's framed really as a question. Um, yeah. If we, we turn the clock back 14 months ago, uh, what we would have done in terms of our modeling, and again, when I say the word modeling, what we're doing is we have a team of people here that take a, a, a case design from the advisor or the agency. We run the source illustration. And then we import that data into a custom loan system that we have, and it integrates the policy dynamics with a prospective loan. So back then, I mean, we were we were always showing, and we're doing this from a due diligence perspective, we're showing higher rates, just continually ratcheting up interest rates. It might be 20, 20, 25 basis points per year, but if we're starting at 2.8, we end, might end up at five and a half or 6%. Mm -hmm. Well, the equation now is a little different, right? So now we have the higher rates on the front side. So the question becomes, well, if, monet if, if monetary conditions change, the Federal Reserve starts to have to open the spigot a little bit in terms of that. And we start seeing the FFR, we see some of these other dynamics starting to move in favor, then we might have monetary policy easing at some standpoint. 
-hmm. So do we start showing lower interest rates in the future? The answer is yes, we have been, but not wholesale magnitude change. I mean, not go from six and a half down to 2% or something like that. We might be leveling off at five or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the discussion we have with some advisors, especially ones that are fairly accustomed to financing space is, well, you're showing the rates too high for too long. Well, okay. But you know, we, we have no way to do that. Um, even though people think we do, we don't. Uh, so I, I say we're trying to play it safe a little bit. We are just showing declining rates, but again, not with something like we're chopping rates in half within 10 years, because we're not. Right. Um, it, it, from our perspective, it's, it's better to be wrong on the conservative side than the other way around. I would agree with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you know, the other dynamic too is on the asset side, we've had a asset deflation. Uh, you know, the markets have recovered to some extent on the equity side of the equation. Um, but, but, but last year, of course, was a total washout, right? I mean, we basically had zero crediting on, on the products, depending on the modality of the, when they enter the index. So we had, a, a, what I call the pincer movement. We had higher rates. So the loan balance was increasing at a greater magnitude and we've got no crediting offset on the side. So that's in our business. If that went on all the time, well, number one, I wouldn't be in the business. And because that'd be the worst dynamic, but you know, these are periods of time where we just have to kind of work through that. And, and hopefully it's a short-term situation. And then of course you could see every day that the equity markets just having spasmatic convulsions over what, what the inflation expectations are and what the fed movements are. So we're just going to have to address that and deal with that. Personally, I think we're going to have kind of flatline equity markets this year too. Sure. So much content you have here. I feel like that we could we could fill another thirty minutes at least. It's very interesting to hear to hear you speak about how our environment today has affected the premium finance landscape. Um, I think we'll we'll pause. Do you have any closing comments before we pause and and open it up for questions? Um, well, we talked a little bit about some of this. Um, so on our our part two, we we're actually going to have a case design discussion. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare and contrast uh, a, re a very real case that actually just closed uh, that started when we were not dealing with higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these cases take a while. And it, it this case kind of went about its merry way. And then all of a sudden, it, it wanted it, they wanted to move towards close, but they had starkly different interest rates, different assumptions that we had to deal with. But as I indicated earlier, that you know our, our case design team and our organization overall is responding to this with different types of techniques. I mean, uh, I you know one thing when people ask us why they do business with us, I can only use one word usually, and that is experience. When when you, I would say that I've seen everything. I don't ever say that, but we've seen a lot here, and we have to take that experience and just pour it into what we do here to try to help everybody. So we've adjusted to the environment. Uh, as I indicated, by delevering the transactions, and we've made other uh, mechanical changes to the policy, which again, when we get into part two, I can go into a little greater detail. Excellent. Uh, great. We're absolutely uh, looking forward to that. Um, one of the benefits of getting older, right, is experience. So um, why don't we open it up for questions while we're waiting to see if there's any final questions. I'd like to remind everyone that today's brew and our full library are recorded and shared on our blue brew blog at www.e4.insurance. And um, let's do our giveaway to Dale, if you could pick a number between one and 25, we'll have our winner. 23. Lucky numbers 23. Oh, Chris Thielen. I hope I'm saying that right, Chris. Chris, congratulations. Be on the lookout for a complimentary CE voucher and a Starbucks gift card that will be coming your way from all of us here at E4 Insurance Services. Thanks, Dale. <laughs> yeah, I got, at full disclosure, he, he did send me a text before the meeting started with that number, but you know, we'll get into oh, that later. it's rigged. All right. Well, <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> um, I am looking to see if there's any questions. I'll just give it a second. And also want to remind everyone that you can unmute your line too, if you do have a question. And I am just perusing through. I am not seeing any at this time. Um, Dale, again, thank you so yeah. much. It's, it's not goodbye. It's, Goodbye for now, because we're going to see you next week on the Brew to, 
to do that case study, which is always great. So we really appreciate having you on today. All righty, thank you. Thanks. Uh, everyone join us next week again as we continue the conversation with Dale for the second Brewcast episode as we review the case studies and transaction management as a part of what we discussed today. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next week on The Brew. Take care.